Scott Foster, technology analyst with HSBC in Tokyo and the editor of the uh, new SNS quarterly letter from Asia. Uh, this morning, uh, we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Robert Horvath, vice chairman of Goldman Sachs International, and Sidney Rittenberg to uh, address the, the topic, the Japan-China relationship, economic key to the next five years. Um, I asked uh, Sidney how he'd like to be introduced, and he said, China consultant and a professor at Pacific Lutheran University. Uh, but if you don't know already, also a friend and colleague of the Chinese leadership from the period of Zhou Enlai uh, all the way to the present day. And if you haven't read it, I would strongly recommend picking up a copy of his book, The Man Who Stayed Behind. Anyway, to get to our topic, uh, <clears throat> over the past few years, the Japan-China economic relationship has grown very rapidly to the point where now Japan does as much trade with China as it does with the United States. And the relationship is still growing, and I believe faster than the relationship with the United States. So uh, perhaps, Bob, you could start by addressing the impact and impl implications of this. Well, I think you're going to see Japan continue to try to expand its ties with China. The interesting thing, if you take the psychology in the United States vis-a-vis -vis China and Japan vis-a-vis -vis China, it's very different. Uh, the United States regards China as this competitive threat, and we've uh, seen the China threat, at least in some quarters, as an excuse to turn inwards and try to uh, blame China for some of the ills that we face here. Japan's been a very different experience in the sense that Japan sees China as an enormous opportunity. Um, a lot of older Japanese companies, Nippon Steel is a good example, that were not doing particularly well in the 1990s, now with the boom in the China market have seen China as a, as a growing opportunity. And, and the other part of it is, from a geostrategic point of view, the Japanese still want to keep a good relationship with the United States because there are lots of tensions with China. There are tensions over the fact that the Chinese haven't received sufficient apology from Japan for Japan's conduct during the war. There are a whole range of issues relating to the Yasukuni Shrine visits by the current prime minister and perhaps future prime minister. So the, the Japanese want to get closer to the Chinese from an economic point of view but there are lots of geopolitical tensions, and from an American point of view, the Japanese are going to still retain a very close uh, relationship with the United States because in the final analysis, they want the Seventh Fleet in the Pacific. They want, uh, if they don't want American troops in a very visible way in Japan, which they don't, they certainly want to know that there is an American security relationship just in case things with China go badly and just in case the Chinese become more muscular in the way they uh, deal with the Japanese. So far, the idea of a peaceful rising in China has been very, uh, I think, comforting to a degree to the, to the Japanese, but the Japanese see a big China, they see a growing China, they see a growing military, they see lots of areas of contention, for instance, lots of competition in the energy area, uh, areas of conflict over drilling. So I think the Japanese relationship with the United States is going to remain relatively strong from a geopolitical point of view, even as they try to improve their relations with the Chinese from an economic point of view. And Sidi, what's, uh, what's the Chinese view of all of this? And, and what's, what's your view from your long experience with the Chinese? Well, I think it's uh, Bob made <coughs> critical point that um, Japan uh, depends on a relationship with the United States, a security relationship, <clears throat> largely because of the tension, both actual and potential, with China. If you turn this around and look at the obverse, it points to a very interesting fact that is often overlooked, and that is Japan is the world's second strongest economy. The Japanese, as we all know, are a very proud people and a very cohesive nation. The 99% of the Japanese population are essentially the same ethnic stock 
that is not true of any other major power. And therefore, as uh, American strategists like Henry Kissinger pointed out 25 years ago, Japan is not content to forever be dependent on a security relationship with the United States. They're not content to be seen as uh, subordinate in strength to any foreign power. But the only way they can extricate themselves from that situation is to resolve their tensions with China. So in that sense, both China and, and Japan are in this strange situation where in order to achieve complete independence in foreign policy, they both have to conciliate with each other. They both have to draw closer to each other. So that, it seems to me, is one of the imperatives that points to the fact that in the, ne in the next five years, I think we're going to see a decisive turning of the tide in Sino-Japan relations. I think the, the two countries are going to work out their major issues and draw considerably closer to each other. The other imperative, of course, as Bob pointed out, is the economic. Japan is a trade with China continues to grow, and by the end of this year, will considerably exceed Chinese, uh, Japanese trade with the United States. So all of these factors push the two countries towards each other rather than apart, it seems to me. Other, other symptoms that haven't attracted a lot of attention. After the meeting, the first meeting of the National People's Congress in China under the new leaders, which was last year. After this session was over in March of last year, the Chinese Premier, Wen Jiabao, made a special statement to the press saying that we are now going to try to resolve our issues with Japan and bring about a major improvement in Sino-Japanese relations. That was swept out of media attention by the fact that right after that came the big demonstrations in China against Japan. So it looked like the whole thing was going up in the air. Actually, it did not go up in the air. Uh, just this past week, the deputy foreign ministers of China and Japan were meeting in China at a regular uh, at a regular systematic meeting that's been set up usually every three months to talk quietly about their strategic issues and to try to resolve things, try to work things out. Of course, in, you have enormous problems because Japan has never really faced up to its own history. Uh, numerous Japanese leaders have apologized in China and in Korea and elsewhere, but the Japanese Diet has rejected an official apology and, a, and an official recognition of Japanese war crimes. So it's a statement by government leaders, but not yet by the government, which is something that China and Korea and other Asian countries want. Also, there's the Yasukuni Shrine issue. It's not simply a matter of, of going to a shrine where the war criminals are remembered, but there's this neat little museum there which really glorifies Japan's role in World War II, which is quite uh, obtrusive. Uh, you know, this is now, for the first time yesterday, attracted the attention of prominent members of Congress, you probably saw in the press, Henry Hyde, chairman of the House Committee on International Affairs, uh, tells the Japanese Prime Minister that if you expect to come in October and address both houses of Congress, you first have to assure us that you will not make a visit to Yasukuni Shrine. So this is a symbol for the Asian countries, and particularly for China. This is a symbol of whether the Japanese leaders are serious about repairing their relationship political relationship with other Asian countries. But there are many loud voices in Japan offering a way out 
for the Japanese leaders. For example, move the war criminals uh, memorials out of the shrine to another shrine and separate the two so that nobody has to lose face and so on. And I think we'll see that uh, uh, after the election in September, there'll probably be some moderation of, of the relationship. I think the tide is going to turn. It's not so obvious now, but I think it's, it's in the cards. And I still think they're going to want to, I think the tide probably will because the Japanese do want to have more normalized <coughs> political relations. But I do think that they still feel that the United States is the critical fallback. Um, just as in Western Europe, they were improving their ties with, this, with Russia, um, they want to keep an American presence there just in case. And, and, I, and, and I think Sydney's right, they will clearly want to move closer. Japanese will want to move closer to the Chinese, but they need an American presence there. Everyone in the region understands that China is a relatively benign force now, but they're not certain that it will be for the foreseeable future, and they don't want to put all their eggs in that basket. And therefore, I think that there will be a, a China is really at the center of what's going on in Asia from a geopolitical and a geoeconomic perspective. But the, the Chinese uh, are still seen as a, as a looming power. There's no one who's quite certain of where China will be 10 years from now. And the notion of having an American fleet somewhere close to your shores is not such a bad fallback position just in case things go badly. So the normalization, I think, will continue, as Sydney said, but it doesn't mean a rupture with the United States and doesn't mean they're going to put all their eggs in the, in the China basket, I don't think. No, I agree. Yeah. I, I think it would be very, it may be very similar to what we've seen in Europe. Yeah, over I, think, I think that's... Uh, and also, when you say no one is certain, where China will be 20 years from now. That includes the Chinese themselves. Sure. <laughs> they're not certain. Yeah. And the other thing is they're not certain where the U.S. will be because there's a lot of concern <coughs> in Asia that the United States is pulling back, that the United States is so preoccupied with the Middle East that we're not going to be a credible presence in that region. So they don't exactly know where we are, and they're, they're, a number of them are making very substantial efforts to make sure the United States maintains a considerable amount of interest and, and military presence in the region without overwhelming them by provoking the Chinese. So finding that right balance is going to be one of the interesting questions that has to be addressed. Yeah, and well, the, uh, the politicians in Japan, the right-wing politicians in Japan have been, I guess it's fair to say, provoking uh, the Chinese and also the South Koreans, the finance ministers and their juniors of all three company, countries have been working on monetary cooperation. And while the, the United States complains a lot about the Chinese foreign exchange rate policy, you never hear complaints from the Japanese on this subject. Instead, you hear about cooperation between the three countries. And Bob, perhaps you could talk about that. Well, I think that's one of the interesting points, that the, that it, the big complaints about the renminbi, the value of the Chinese currency, have come primarily from Western Europe and from the United States, whereas Japan sees this as a, as a huge opportunity in a way, and they're less concerned about offshoring. There's a big difference, however. I mean, the Japanese, we have a more rapid growth in population. We have a lot of unemployment, and our politicians tend to use this currency issue as an excuse for a lot of other things that we're not doing well. I mean, the, the currency issue has nothing to do with our insufficient attention to education. Point was made earlier. We're not turning out a lot, a lot of engineers. The Chinese are. Um, but we tend to look at the currency issue as a proxy for a lot of things that are, that are not going well. And the other part of it is that we do have a very big balance of trade and current account imbalance with the Chinese. Um, and that comes up all the time. The Chinese have huge amounts of currency reserves, they are buying a lot of dollar denominated bonds, large, large numbers of treasury bonds. There's this big imbalance and there's this feeling that somehow uh, the Chinese are doing two things to us. One of them is they are undermining our economy by selling a lot of goods to the United States, weakening the American economy, when in fact they're really benefiting the American consumer. The other side of it is that they're providing a lot of capital to the United States which is terrific if you're in the mortgage market. It's helped you with the, to get a lower mortgage, 
but there's a concern that somehow the Chinese at some point will pull the plug. So this notion of dependence and disruption do trouble people. You don't get, in that, get, don't get that in Japan. First of all, the Japanese have a very positive trade relationship, much more positive trade relationship with China. They're selling a lot of goods to China, a lot of capital goods, a lot of other things. And second, the Chinese aren't buying a lot of their securities, so they don't feel this dependence, this capital market dependence on China. And I think those are, those are some of the reasons why. The other thing is the Japanese economy has undertaken a lot of reform over the last decade. It's been a lost decade in terms of growth, but if you look at what's happened internally in Japanese companies, they become much more competitive and much more global. Toyota was mentioned, I'm on the, inter on the international board of Toyota. F 10 years ago, they were very concerned about investing a lot in China. They said, you know, we'll give a lot of capital there, Chinese will have low leverage over us. Uh, now they see China as a huge opportunity, and it's not just the auto sector, it's almost any major sector. So the Japanese have taken a great deal of advantage. Some American companies have too. Qualcomm is a good example, have taken a lot of advantage of the opportunity in China. But a lot of companies, um, particularly manufacturing companies, feel somewhat threatened and have really not seized the China market as well as the Japanese have. What do you think about the possibility of East Asian monetary union and the, using the huge dollar reserves, uh, which are now as four countries with huge dollar reserves, to uh, achieve complete independence from the IMF and American well, pressure. It won't be so much independence from the IMF, but they are really creating an Asian bond market. They have Asian bond fund one, two, and three. They have a lot of other Asian monetary cooperation arrangements. It's very different from Europe, where you have a political agreement to create a framework. First, there was the European uh, common market, now the European Union. You don't have that in Asia, but there's a lot of pragmatic cooperation. Sydney was pointing out at the, at the finance minister level and the economic official level, these people are meeting all the time. There's a lot of cooperation. We don't see it, but if you look at China as sort of a hub with spokes, they're creating trade agreements all around the region, including Latin America and elsewhere. They're creating a whole uh, range of financial arrangements that relate to China, Japan, and elsewhere, and, and other parts of the region, South Korea. And they're developing a network, which I don't think is directly threatening to the United States, or the IMF, but it certainly means that they're going to be much more able to deal with global trading problems internally and a lot less dependent on international capital markets and on international trade. They will be a lot less dependent 10 years from now than they are today because of these arrangements that they're establishing. One thing interesting about the Chinese approach to Japan, if you notice when the Chinese president visited a couple of weeks ago, uh, two places, Seattle and Washington, D.C., and of course Yale. Uh, in Seattle, everything was sweetness and light. The Chinese got a terrific welcome. In Washington, D.C., everything went wrong. But the fact that everything went wrong was not mentioned, not a single word, in the Chinese press, nor were there official uh, protests and so on and so forth. Of course, everybody knows it because of the Internet but not from the official press. So this is the attitude that China takes today towards the United States. Why? Because essentially they're satisfied with the state of the relationship between the United States and China. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's okay. On the other hand, the slightest affront from a Japanese official, even a minor cabinet official, will arouse a major protest from, from Beijing. Why? Two reasons. One, because of the great animus among ordinary Chinese towards Japan, the memories of the old days. Well, we know that this is a reality that doesn't go over, away overnight, but it can go away. Look at Germany and France today. Compare them to Germany and France 50 years ago. But the other reason I think is, is, is the key, and that is that they are not happy with the state of Sino-Japanese relations, and therefore they want things to change. They want to get the attention of the Japanese leaders and bring the relationship into parameters that are more acceptable to them. That's why you have all this pressure. 
So it's not intended to lead towards a break or towards further distance. It's intended to influence the domestic Japanese political scene in a direction that's more favorable to Sino-Japanese relations. A lot of us in the, in the States uh, and elsewhere tend to assume that the Chinese economy will grow steadily, more or less forever, maybe become as big as the United States. Um, but uh, looking at what's happened in Japan in the past couple decades, uh, we have to ask the question, what, what, what's the chance of a Chinese banking or currency crisis in the next five years? Uh, <laughs> why don't you start? You know, of all the things that are wor worrisome, uh, different crises in China, in, in my mind, the banking and financial issue is a minor, comparatively a minor issue, compared to the still widening urban-rural gap, compared to official corruption, compared to the environmental issues. Uh, these, these are really sharp. The banking issue, as a Chinese banker friend said to us a couple of years ago, he said, don't forget, we still own the banks. As long as we own the banks, and we also own the printing presses, don't worry about our banks. They're not, the sky is not going to fall in. And I think essentially that's true. The, the whole Chinese banking system is in a process of transition from being the Ministry of Finance to gradually converting themselves into commercial banks, but they have a long, long way to go yet. And so far, it's, it's controllable. Yeah, I, I very much agree. I think you, Chinese banks are called banks, but you, you really can't look at them like you look at an American bank in the following sense, that many of them make loans for what they call policy reasons. That is to say that some regional party chairman says you should lend money to this factory or that factory. And to a degree, they have to lend because they don't want these factories to close down, which would send a lot of unemployed people out into the market, which would cause uh, economic and political and social instability. So many of the loans they make are really for, for policy reasons. You wouldn't, for instance, the, the Treasury, the American Treasury has deficits every year. The money doesn't get repaid. You wouldn't say the Treasury was bankrupt, although could be at some point, um, but, but, uh, but the same, to the China, you have to look at Chinese banks almost the same way as you look at the Treasury of the United States. The second point is that the government has $900 billion in reserves, and it has already recapitalized two banks in very substantial amounts of money, and is willing to do that for other banks. Third is they take the loans, the bad loans, off the books of the banks and put them in these asset management companies and sell them down over a period of time, or at least try to. They haven't been overly successful at doing that. And fourth, as Sydney said, they have the printing press, um, which they're reluctant to use. I mean, they do have now an almost independent central bank, not entirely, but more independent than, in, than it was 10 years ago. So they, they would probably refrain from doing this, but at the last minute, if they needed to, they would. But they've got so much money in their reserves to recapitalize banks that they could do that. And the other thing is that they are improving the quality of the banking system. Credit standards are improving, management's improving, they're allowing foreigners to buy into these banks, which they were not able to do several years ago, and, and they're improving the process. But they're not going to completely eliminate these loans for political reasons because they don't want the instability of high unemployment. And the bigger problems that Sydney's correctly pointed out are these huge urban-rural gaps, a lot of instability in rural China, lots of de violent demonstrations against the government for corruption and for uh, environmental problems. The environment's a big issue for closing down factories. I think those are the more uh, salient problems that, that the government has to face. And if it can deal with that, Im that rural-urban imbalance and coastal versus central western China imbalance, that's, that's the critical element here. The banking system is a problem, but it's a manageable problem. It's just money. The other is there social political issues, which are much more uh, difficult to, to manage. Okay, we have uh, four minutes left. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please uh, step up to the mic. No question? All right, good. Uh, Simon Hackett. Gentlemen, just a, a quick question on a slightly different topic. There's China and, and Japan, but there's a kind of a triumvirate there. The thing I often wonder about is Taiwan. 
and where Taiwan is likely to be in three to five years' time in, a, in that environment. I always think of the One China policy and think, gee, it sounds like a kind of an oxymoron. There really are two there. So in five years' time, will there still be two? In five years' time, uh, my guess is there will still be two. But I think what we'll see over time is a gradual working out of some sort of confederation deal, some sort of arrangement where Taiwan still manages their own affairs, has their own international agreements, but there's one, as the Chinese say, one national flag, one national anthem, and an acknowledgement of a central government, but still with full autonomy for Taiwan to run their own affairs. I think ultimately that's, that's the kind of deal that we'll see. Does anyone think that China confers any better trade benefits to the United States because of the difficulties in the Japanese relationship with China? Do we get any preferences in your mind from them in any way, economically, trade, uh, uh, you know, the bond, uh, you know, the monies, economics, because of the problems between Japanese and Chinese relationships? I think I haven't come across any direct benefit of that kind, but the one benefit that's definitely there is that typically Chinese show a preference for dealing with American companies over Japanese companies, or German companies over Japanese companies, or almost anyone over Japanese com companies. They're, we've been approached by, by uh, Chinese uh, enterprises saying the Japanese have offered us a deal to do thus and so. If you could find us an American company to do the same kind of deal, even if it cost us a little more, we'd rather deal with an American company. So you do run into that sort of favor. You know, but in the long run, in my view, that's not good for us either. Yeah, I think the other part of it is, I, I don't think there are any particular, uh, Sydney's right in terms of the businesses, they like to deal with American companies. The big advantage we have, I think, is not so much that they prefer that there's a, a, a governmental uh, uh, effort to discriminate in favor of us against Japanese companies. I think the huge advantage we have is education. I think the fact that there's so many Chinese studying in the United States at all levels, all institutes of higher learning in this country is an enormous advantage. They go to American business schools, they go to American engineering schools, they work as interns for American companies. We have lots of Chinese working for us in New York and elsewhere in the world. That cultural link is very, very powerful. And they know how we do business. They understand the American business environment very well. And when they go back to China, this helps them. And therefore, they, they, they feel comfortable working with Americans culturally, economically, and from a business point of view. I think that is an enormous advantage. That's why I think opening, keeping our, our borders open to people who want to get H-1B visas and education visas and all those things is critically important. That is a huge comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis China that we have and the Japanese don't. Hi, Mark Prensky again. Tying together this in the last session, um, the young people who are using the phones, who are now communicating with each other in different ways, using the internet, using all these things, is that, do you think, going to make a change in the animosities or will it pass down vertically from country to country? It already has made a difference. The, the demonstrations against Japan were mainly got up through SMS messages and cellular phone calls and internet. So much so that after the demonstrations began getting out of hand and were quieted down by the Chinese government, the Ministry of Public Security issued a stern announcement to the effect that using internet, SMS, cell phones to get up unauthorized uh, demonstrations was uh, against the law and that people that did that would be prosecuted. So it is having an effect. It can be for better or for worse. It can be a good effect or a bad effect. It's hard to catch those people, though. These people are very good at it. Yeah. So they have, they've learned. It is changing China, though, because they can communicate 
But I'll give you a very interesting example. It's also a plus for the leadership in the sense that it enables them to figure out what's going on among their people. I can remember a conversation when Zhu Rongji was premier. And I'd gotten to know him pretty well when he was mayor of, of, of Shanghai. And Sydney knows him very well. And he made a very interesting point. He said, you know, I go on the internet. This is the premier of China, premier of China, would go on the internet for two or three hours a week. And why would he go on? Because he could hear over the internet and see messages over the internet what people thought about his policies, what they thought about the government's policies, what they thought was going on. And that was an enormously important source of information that he could get. And these people were anonymous to him, although once in a while the security forces go after them. It's a little bit hard to do. But this was a very, and he would also go on the internet in other countries to find out what they were saying about China. It's, an, it's a very good way of getting information if you're a leader in a country where the people are not going out in the streets on a, on a regular basis complaining. You can hear these complaints ahead of time on the internet and respond to them much more effectively other than they otherwise could. What, what, if I can just follow up for one second. The question was, what about cross countries? In other words, I, young people in Japan getting closer to young people in China or, or vice versa generationally because they do these things. You mean Chinese, Japanese using the internet? I, I mean, I guess they do it. It's not their, their, their language difference. English, they do, they do do it between Chinese and Americans. I know that at a very, on, a, on a very regular basis. Chinese and Japanese, I, they, the only question then would be the linguistic problem, and since almost all these Chinese, the young Chinese kids know English, if the Japanese kids speak English, I'm sure they could do it. Otherwise, it'd be a little more difficult to do. Sorry, I'm going to have to cut us off here. We're out of time. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. Thanks.